Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning. I missed you last week, and uh, it's good to be back with you this uh, this Sunday morning. I uh, I don't like being away, uh, but I do like coming back. Amen. Amen. Well, it's so good to see you this morning. Uh, thank you for praying for me and my family this past week. We uh, we battled with the COVID, so uh, and it won, and it won. Um, but uh, we we got out of quarantine uh, this past uh, Friday, Saturday, and uh, so we're here with you and could not be more excited to be with you. So if you have your bulletin, go ahead and open your bulletin there and look inside. And I want to point out a few things there in your bulletin to you. In a few moments, uh, Keith is going to come and he's going to read uh, Psalm 75 for us. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and take it out and turn uh, to Psalm 75, and he'll read that for us in just a few moments. And as you know, it's our, it's our habit here to pray for other churches in our community, and so today is no different. We're going to pray for the First Presbyterian Church. The First Presbyterian Church is downtown, um, very close to the Methodist Church. You could actually throw a baseball and hit the Methodist Church, very close downtown. But we're going to pray for them today, the First Presbyterian Church, and Keith will read Psalm 75 for us in just a few moments. On the inside of your bulletin there, there is a question. We put this question in the bulletin each week. This is for you and for your family. And uh, hopefully you use these questions to, uh, to spur on conversation in your home uh, between husband and wife and also between parents and, and children. At least that's our aim, that's our hope that you would do that. The question for this week is, why do we call him our Lord? Why do we call Jesus Christ our Lord? And the answer is because not with gold or silver, but with his precious blood, he has set us free from sin and the tyranny of the devil. And he has bought us body and soul to be his very own. Amen. Amen. And you have the verses there that correspond with that answer and with that question. Today we're going to be in the book of Philemon. Philemon's a very short book. And we're going to look at it. As you know, we've been working our way through each book of the Bible. We've come to the book of Philemon. And so um, we will look at it today. Again, I want to welcome you to Grace Baptist Church. I'm so thrilled to be here with you, to be in the land of the living and, uh, and to see you and to be encouraged by you. We will resume Wednesday night service this, uh, this Wednesday night. I've missed you, so we're going we're gonna to be back together this Wednesday night. All right, 6 o'clock Wednesday night. Uh, let me pray, and then Keith, you come and you read Psalm 75 for us on this Lord's Day. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this day as we know that it is a gift from your hand and we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so we're thankful for this day. We are also very thankful for the beautiful sunshine that you've given us on this day. And it reminds us of how you shine your light into our hearts and you give us the truth, namely the truth in your son, Jesus our Christ. And we ask today that you would bless us with your presence, that you would invigorate our faith, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word, and that you would grant us a deep, deep joy in believing the gospel. We pray for our friends at the First Presbyterian Church, that you would bless them with the assurance of your word, that you would confirm your testimonies and promises to them, and encourage and spur them on in the faith of the gospel. Lord, again, we thank you for this day, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. My, we got a house full. It looks great. Open your Bibles with me, uh, if you would, to Psalm 75, and we'll read this together. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a psalm of Ahaz, a song. We give thanks to you, O God. 
We give thanks to your name is near. We recount, recount your wondrous deeds at the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. Slay. I say to the boastful, do not boast, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horn, and do not lift up your horn and high, or speak with haughty neck. For the east, for from the east or the west, and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but I, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup of foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth shall dra drain it down to the dregs. But as I, I will declare it forever, I will sing praises to God of Jacob, and the horn of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. God bless, bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And uh, as Kevin said, thank you for this wonderful day and the day of life that you've given us, that you anointed. And Lord, we thank you for all that, um, that you do for us. And Lord, thank you for this, uh, this uh, verse here that we read. In all that goes on in the world, uh, we know that you are in control, and that's what gives us comfort. Lord, help us to understand that and always lean on you when, when times get rough and, and get difficult in our life. Lord, I, I thank you again for this day. I thank you for, for the love we have for each other. I thank you for this church. And the Lord, most of all, thank you for Jesus who died for us and is interceding for us right now. Bless our service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again and welcome everyone to Grace Baptist Church. If you would all please stand with us at this time. We are going to sing some songs and hymns and praise to the Lord this morning. And we'll begin by singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us. <clears throat> How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath brought me life i know that it is We'll be singing next to hymn number 11, All Creatures, Our God and King, and we'll sing the first and last stanza this morning. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and let us sing. Gleam. Oh, praise Him, 
Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in righteousness. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Praise, praise the hand of God the Son, and praise the Spirit three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Our hymn today will be hymn 447, and aren't we glad it is well with our soul because of what Jesus did on the cross for us this morning. Amen. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like seas billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well. My soul and Lord haste the day when my face shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well my soul. Amen and amen. May be seated. If you have a copy of the Bible with you today, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philemon. Philemon, very, very short book, right after the book of Titus. And I'm going to read the whole book today. Philemon, there is no chapter, there's no, well there are verses, but 
There's no chapters, just one, just 25 verses. And I'm going to read this uh, tiny little book in just a few moments. As you're turning there to the book of Philemon, there are two words that will guide us today as we look at this wonderful little book. The first word is the word past, and the second word is the word appeal. So the word past and the word appeal. All right, let's pray together and ask the Lord to to bless our time in his word, and then I will read the book of Philemon. All right, let's pray. Father, incline our hearts now to your word. Confirm the testimonies of your word to us. Open our eyes to see it and open our hearts to believe. We ask that you would work in us to will and to do according to your good purpose and pleasure and that you would grow us in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. Satisfy us today with your loving kindness, as we have seen it in the gospel. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Philemon. Hear now the reading of God's word. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon... Our beloved fellow worker, and Apthia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner for Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this perhaps is why he has parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it. To say nothing of you owing me your very own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as does Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen and amen. Well, Philemon is a real man, as you can see, and Onesimus is a real man, 
as you can see. And Paul wrote a letter to this man, Philemon. Now, Paul had written 12 other letters. This is one of the last letters that he wrote. And he had a real concern for this man named Philemon. And so that's where the book gets its title. And you can also see that it's very brief, very compact. Now, Paul assumes a few things about Philemon. He knew Philemon personally. When you and I read the book of Philemon, or really any book in the Bible for that matter, we are eavesdropping on a conversation. We don't know the full import of what's going on between these two men. So Paul is assuming something on Philemon's behalf, and that is that Philemon believes the gospel. So as you and I draw in today and we read the book of Philemon, we have to know that is an assumption that Paul is making about this man named Philemon. So just so there's no assumption on any of our parts, what is the gospel? What is Paul assuming Philemon knows? And frankly, what is he assuming that you know when you read this book? Well, he is assuming that you know and that you believe that God saves sinners. He's he's assuming that you believe that God saves sinners through His Son, Jesus Christ. He's assuming that you believe that in Christ Jesus, you have been forgiven of your sins. He's also assuming that you know deeply, not just here, but deep in your knower, that you don't deserve to be forgiven, yet you are forgiven. He's assuming that you believe the gospel. He's assuming that you know Christ savingly, not just mentally, not just academically, but that you know Him and that He has become personal to you and that Jesus has forgiven your sin and Jesus has forgiven my sin. He's assuming that you know that. He's also assuming here that you know that Christ mediates between God and you. That Christ simultaneously touches God since He is God and He simultaneously touches us since He's one of us. That Jesus is the ultimate mediator between God and man. And this God-man lived and died perfectly and He was raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven and He sits at the right hand of God the Father even this morning mediating for you and me. That Jesus is keeping us saved this morning. Now isn't that a glorious statement? Amen would be the word to respond. I missed you, but I will still amen myself if I have to. What a glorious thought this this Lord's day. Aside from Philemon, aside from me seeing you and you seeing me and it being a, a grand reunion, forget all that. Jesus Christ is praying for you this morning and keeping you saved. That's a wonderful thought. Paul assumes that Philemon knows that. He assumes that Philemon believes it. But there's something else he assumes. He assumes that Philemon knows that the gospel unifies different people. That in the gospel, there is no black or white, or Jew or Gentile, or slave or free. He's assuming that you realize that at the foot of the cross, everyone is equal. And whatever divisions that we may put on humanity are erased At the foot of the cross. Now this was hard for Philemon. It was hard 
because of his past relationship with Onesimus. Onesimus was an indentured servant to Philemon. An indentured servant in the ancient world worked like this. The servant would go to the wealthy individual and contract with the wealthy individual. And the servant would say, I will work for you for seven years or four years or five years or whatever it was, the terms. And in exchange for me working for you for seven years, you will give me food and you will give me shelter and you will give me clothing. The the closest thing that we have to this today would be an employee and an employer relationship. Where an employee goes to the employer and says, I will work for you. And the employer says, I will pay you X amount of dollars to do so. And you shake hands or you sign an agreement or whatever it is. You are now in that employer's debt. The only difference today is that you can leave your job at any time you want to. Then there was a contract that stipulated you stay for a certain period of time. Onesimus enters into one of these contracts with Philemon. And Philemon is upholding his side of the deal. He's providing shelter, he's providing clothing, he's providing food. He's providing all these things. Well, Onesimus decides that he's going to leave. He's going to run away. So he invalidates his contract. This, of course, makes Philemon upset, very angry. Here I have promised to take care of you and I've upheld my end of this contract. I've given you food and shelter and clothing. And then all of a sudden you just run. I've got work to do in the field or I've got work to do somewhere and you were helping me do that. Now you're gone and now I'm, in the, I'm just in a pinch. So Onesimus runs off. Wouldn't you know it, of all the places in the Roman Empire that this man could run, he runs into Paul. And Paul knows Philemon. And Paul leads this man, Onesimus, to Christ. And he says, there's something that you need to know about being a person who is in Christ. You have to make good on your word. So now you have to go back to Colossae. That's where Philemon was. There's a book in the New Testament called Colossians. This is where they were. And you have to make it right with Philemon. Now Onesimus says, I'm not going back. I'm not going back because he can kill me under the law. I ran from him. I invalidated our contract. And Paul says, no, you're going to be a Christian and you're going to fulfill your obligations and your duties. You're going to go back to Philemon. Let me handle Philemon. And then he writes this letter. The letter of Philemon. Does that make more sense now? Now, there's two words that I want you to consider with me as we look at this book. The first word is the word past. The word past. Philemon had expressed love and compassion in the past to fellow believers. Now there's a new believer coming to him. His name is Onesiphorus. But this man has wronged Philemon. Bet you wish I skipped another Sunday, didn't you? (laughs) Have you ever been wronged by someone? The answer to that question is yes. If you've lived long enough, you have been. How then does a person who has not done anything to deserve wrong respond to an individual who does them wrong? 
How should we live is the question. When people do wrong to us and it's undeserved. Now you well know there are some times in life when we deserve wrong. Can I get a witness? (laughs) We do something kind of silly and we get silly consequences. So we can't throw up our hands and go, the consequences are not something I deserve. No, you do stupid things, you get stupid consequences. I'm not talking about that here though. Philemon didn't do anything wrong. This man left him. Left him in a pinch. They both shook hands or signed a contract or whatever they did and he did him wrong. So my question for you as we just begin here, have you ever been wronged? Undeservedly. Someone just did something to you and it was wrong. And you scratch your head and think, what did I do to deserve that? Or you perhaps think, well, I must have done something to deserve that. This is the case for Philemon. But Philemon was innocent. He hadn't done anything wrong. Brothers and sisters, bad things happen to Christians all the time. I had a a dear lady come up to me at a church one time and she said, why do bad things happen to good people? And I said, could you please introduce me to the good people? Because I've never met them. Bad things don't happen to good people because there's no such thing as good people. Bad things happen to bad people every day. That's part of living in a world like we live. So the question is, how do we, as gospel believers, we believe that we're forgiven. We believe Jesus is the right hand of the Father, praying for us, keeping us saved. We believe that Jesus unifies diverse and different types of people How should we live now? Knowing that people have wronged us, knowing that people will wrong us, how should we live? Paul points out something to Philemon in verses 4 through 7. He says, I thank my God always as I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and your faith that you have toward Jesus and all the saints. Stop. Philemon was a man who believed the gospel and who loved fellow believers. He loved them. Much like you love each other in this room. You believe the gospel and you love each other. He has a past track record of loving and forgiving and being in communion with other Christians. Paul is a master communicator. Because Paul is gently setting up the case for him to forgive the man who wronged him. And he starts by saying, I know that you can do this because you've already done this multiple times. So Philemon had expressed love and compassion for fellow believers in the past. Notice what verse 6 says. And I pray that the sharing of your faith might become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us For the sake of Christ. Verse 7 almost jerks a tear. Verse 7 he says, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. He says, I'm a recipient of it. I know that you love me. And I'm a fellow believer. And because of your faith in Christ, your love for your neighbor, namely me, 
I know that you can now love other saints too. He says, your heart, the hearts of many saints have been refreshed through you. I've told you this before. That's certainly worth saying again here. We all have people in our lives that we love to see coming, don't we? We see that person walk through the church door. Or we see that person at, somewhere in town. And we just, we just enjoy seeing that person. That person refreshes us. That person, whoever it may be, is an encouragement to us. And then on the other hand, <laughs> there are some <laughs> that we see coming that discourages us. Right? The word encourage means you put in to somebody. You put courage in them. Discourage means you take courage out of them. We are people who need courage. And we need to encourage one another. And this is his past testimony. He has encouraged the saints and refreshed their hearts. There was just something, it did something in the hearts of the believers when they saw this man, Philemon. So he says, you've already experienced this. You've already done this. So here's the second word. It's the word appeal. The word appeal. Now Paul appeals to Philemon to forgive and to accept Onesimus not as an indentured servant, but as a believer of the gospel. Notice what he says in verse number 8. Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. All right, let's stop. How much hubris must you have to say that? Are some of you asleep or did you hear me say that? He said, I am bold enough, Paul. Hello, we believe you, okay? I am bold enough to command you to do this. But I want you to notice his appeal. His appeal is not in his manhood. His appeal is in verse 9. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you for my child Onesimus. For what sake? For love. He says, I am not going to coerce you to coerce you would mean that Paul was a cult leader and you had to do it Paul's way because Paul was the cult of personality. But Paul says, no, there's actually a greater motivation for you to love and for you to forgive people who wrong you. And here's the motivation. Christ loved you. Now, how many of you this morning are willing, you are willing to stand up, I'll give you the mic, open mic night right here on Sunday morning. How many of you would be willing this morning on an open mic to go, you know, I deserve the forgiveness of Jesus. I deserve it. Anybody? Going once, going twice, sold. None of us deserve the forgiveness of of God. None of us deserves the forgiveness from Jesus. Amen. So now there are people in our lives that do not deserve our forgiveness. How will you live? Will you live as a person who says, oh, <laughs> I don't deserve his love and forgiveness, but he sure gave it to me. And then there's someone else in your life that doesn't deserve yours. And you say, no, you wronged me. That's a bit too much for Sunday morning, isn't it? That's what we call a hypocrite. With their mouth, they say, I, I, 
am loved by God, which is true. I am forgiven by God in Christ, which is true. But then they do not have the love or the forgiveness to extend to someone who has done them wrong. Beloved, Christianity is extremely difficult. Do you see that? That's the reason there's so few actual Christians. He says, I'm not appealing to you based on my coercion of you. Like I'm the leader of the church and therefore I, I command you. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. I, I'm just going to appeal to you on the basis of, of love. Has God loved you in Christ? Has God forgiven you in Christ? Then you need to love and forgive as Christ has loved and forgiven you. Do you see? Look at verse 11. Formerly, this man was useless to you, but now... He is indeed useful to you and to me. He, he was a slave to you. He was just a worker. He was just an employee. He just fulfilled a, 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 a modest function in your life, whether it was bringing in the crops or planting the crops or whatever it was. He just had this, 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 this small usefulness to you. But now, but now, Philemon, he's become a Christian. This man, Philemon, now has what I have and what you have. He has Christ. So we cannot look at him based on our class distinctions. We cannot look at him as, well, Philemon, you are wealthy and he is poor. You no longer can look at that these definitions or these categories anymore. Now you must look at him as a fellow believer in Christ. Why? Because everyone is equal at the cross. How sad is it? How sad is it in 2022 there are preachers standing in pulpits probably even this morning who are saying that white people need to repent of being white. No, beloved. You don't repent of being white. You repent of being a sinner. And when you come to Christ there is no color. And when you come to Christ there is no gender. When you come to Christ, there is no class. When you come to Christ, there is no education level. When you come to Christ, there's no socioeconomic level. When you come to Christ, it is you are either in Christ or not in Christ. Why would we go back to something that is worldly and fleshly to divide God's people? He says, no, he was formerly useless to you, but now he's useful to you because now he's in Christ. Yes, he was an indentured slave and yes, he was your indentured slave, but that division is now wiped out because he came to Christ. In verse 15, he says, for this perhaps is why he was Parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. Especially to me, but much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This man left you, but he bumped into me. And when he bumped into me, Guess who I led him to? How many of you know that there is a strange and yet invisible hand that is guiding and governing all the affairs of this world? How many of you know that while you cannot see the hand, there is a hand and you're in it? 
How many of you know that that hand belongs to the good shepherd? And we say about that invisible hand and his mysterious providence and workings, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Only goodness and mercy follow me every day of my life. See, only a person who believes in the invisible hand can say that shepherd's psalm. Now Paul says to Philemon, can you not see the invisible hand here? This man left you and wronged you, but in God's providence, he found me and I led him to Jesus. How many of you know that providence is the best teacher alive so his appeal here is not only to the love of God in the gospel but also the providence of God but verses 17 18 and 19 is where I think Paul (laughs) what a communicator he is is all I'll say you listen to this and just imagine if someone said this to you ready Verse 17, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. (laughs) You owe me your life, he says. You owe me your life. Philemon, you know what you know about Christ because I taught you what you know about Christ. Philemon, I came into Colossae. I met you. I discipled you. I trained you. I taught you about the incarnation. I taught you about the substitution. I taught you about the resurrection. I taught you about His enthronement and His intercession at the right hand. I taught you about His return. I've taught you how to live the Christian life. Do you not remember, Philemon, you owe me everything? And so all I'm asking you to do is forgive this one guy. Isn't he a master communicator? Lord, help us. I've given you my life, so give your life to him. Isn't that a reference to the gospel? In the gospel, do we not see Jesus Christ giving his life? Giving his life for whom? For sinful people that did not deserve it. And now as gospel people, people who believe that message, are we not now people who give our lives in self-sacrifice and self-denial to people who do not deserve our forgiveness? It's hard to amen that. It's hard to study it. It's hard to preach it. It's hard to say that to you because let's face it. We love ourselves. In fact, if you ask me, hey, Kevin, are you in love? I'd say, I am in love. And y'all go, oh, how sweet. He's in love with Marianne. No, I'm in love with me. I wake up thinking about myself. I go through the day thinking about myself. I go to bed thinking about myself. I think about myself way too much. This is the reason that Jesus said, if you will follow me, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. (laughs) I don't need to think of myself more, I need to think of myself less. And the way I think of myself less is by thinking of others more. Can I get a witness? So the thrust of this book here is, you need to forgive as you've been forgiven. You need to love as you have been loved. 
This is the application of the gospel. This is how we live. So very briefly, let me give you a few take-homes, a few points of application. The first one is, I, I want you to think about someone in your life who needs your forgiveness but does not deserve your forgiveness. This person is in your life and this person is in need of your forgiveness, but this person does not deserve your forgiveness. It's almost magical how people popped into our mind just then, isn't it? I'm not even going to ask you who came into your mind. Somebody did. Because that person did something to you wrong. And you are holding on to it. Thinking that somehow by holding on to that wrong that they did, you can get them back. Or it will make it right. For many of us, we contemplate revenge. We hold on to it. The person did us wrong. I'm going to remember that. And when I get my opportunity, I'm going to pounce. And all the while we're thinking about revenge or making that wrong right, the other person's just walking around not even knowing, not even thinking about it. Unforgiveness only affects the one who's not willing to forgive. You're the only one carrying that. If I may be so honest to tell you, the other person doesn't care. Because the other person cares about themselves. Just like you only care about yourself. So I want you to think about that person. The person doesn't deserve it. I readily admit that. The person does not deserve it. And now I want you to do something with that person. When that person comes to mind, every time that person comes to mind, I want you to say to the Lord about that person, I love and forgive that person. I love and forgive that person. Brothers and sisters, that's the only application of this gospel. That is the way we move forward. That is the way that our hearts heal. Here's a second application. <laughs> I want you to pray for growth and grace. Some of you I realize I just lost on number one. So if I lost you on number one, number two is for you. I want you to pray for growth and grace. I want you to pray that God would widen His grace to you. That He would deepen His grace to you. That He would heighten His grace to you. That He would show you the dimensions of His grace toward you. This is what Romans 8 is about. Romans 8 verses 37 through 39 where he says, No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. There's nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So when we pray, we're praying for God to grow the awareness of his grace in our lives. It's not as though God's grace is getting deeper. It's not as though God's grace is getting wider. It's that you are becoming more aware of how deep it is and how wide it is for you. And when you begin to contemplate how wide and deep and high and long is the grace of God toward you, then you will have grace to give to people that don't deserve it. 
And then the last application is this. If you're not a believer of the gospel, I ask you today to seek the forgiveness of God in Jesus. If you're not a believer of the gospel and you've never been forgiven, a lot of what I've just said is rubbish to you. You're probably sitting there thinking, I'm not going to do this. You know what that person has done to me? I'm not going to forgive that person. I'm not going to love that person. This is ludicrous. This is madness. What is this guy saying? Perhaps if that's you, you need to seek the forgiveness of God in Christ. And you need to find in Christ the forgiveness that will heal you this morning. Paul told Philemon, I don't appeal to you based on strong arm. I don't appeal to you based on coercion. I appeal to you based on the love of God in Christ. So as Paul appealed to Philemon, I now appeal to you on the grace, the love, and the forgiveness of God in the gospel. May God bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, and we thank you for the book of Philemon. We thank you for the, the episode that took place between him and Onesimus. We thank you for Paul and his words and how he drove Philemon. And by way of Philemon, he drove us this morning to the foot of the cross. I ask that you would work in our hearts that you would grow us in grace and that you would grant us repentance unto life and faith in Christ. That we would be people also that are willing to extend what we've received. Father, that is very hard to pray and it's even harder to do. So we ask that you would take up our lives And do it through us. Father, in these next few moments as we come to the Lord's Supper table, we ask that you would grant us joy in our forgiveness. And that you would grant us joy in the righteousness of Christ, which makes us acceptable to you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.